Um, hello, everyone. How are y'all doing? <laughs> cool. Um, thank you so much for joining um, this panel discussion. We'll be talking about how we've navigated the surge of open source in Africa. We're kind of going to divide it into like three sections where we focus on the before, like how it all started, um, the current um, state of open source and what we did that led to that current state. And then also the hope we have for like um, the community in the next couple of years and long-term goals as well. My name is Edith Young Asikbo. I work as a developer advocate at Zuplo. I love writing technical articles, building dev communities and contributing to open source. Um, at OSCAR, which is Open Source Community Africa, I lead the um, community team where I work with Balaji, another person who champions the community um, team and ensures that we have an active community in the different chapters where we currently have OSCAR. Uh, good, good morning, everyone. <laughs> Uh, so yes, my name is Samson Gadi. I uh, the co-founder for the Open Source Community Africa. So basically, the Open Source Community Africa is an organization that is primarily designed to create structure for advocacy and project. Uh, started sometime in 2017, I believe, um, but officially things started working in 2018. So, um, but aside from Oscar, I, I work at Hedera now, where I do open source work. Um, basically, just um, making sure that we're good open source citizens. Um, but aside from that, I spend a lot of unhealthy time on Twitter, on well, now X, um, and mostly doing community work, DevRel. Um, I like to talk about open source a lot. Um, and then reasons why I flew 20 plus hours to get here today. So so really excited about yeah, the team. Um, hi, everyone. My name is Princess, and I am a software engineer at Drogo AI. I have recently joined Drogo. Um, at Oscar, I lead the engineering efforts, so I'm the engineering lead at um, Open Source Community Africa. Um, aside from Oscar, I also contribute to the um, Kubernetes project and Kairos as well. So um, today we're going to be discussing what we've done so far with Oscar, um, where we are currently at and where we're headed. So, um, Samson is going to give a brief history of how it started. So, Samson, how did you get into open source? How did I get into open source is quite interesting. I would say by frustration, which, which is interesting. So, I was much, much younger then, a um, huge fan of football. I would never call it soccer, but yeah, football. <laughs> I was a huge fan of uh, football and back then i think it was kind of like winning 11 before fifa i think so the i had my friends installing games on on windows computers and the goal was for me to obviously get mine into my own computer and it was interesting because at that time what i was using had no idea that it was a different operating system so i got so frustrated because i wanted to install .exe file on the on the linux i think it was fedora i believe um, so trying to do that process, I figured that, oh, okay, it, it was crazy. And going into the internet and trying to research, and then I discovered that there was an entire different world of open source and, and then different operating systems. So that's kind of what got me started into open source. So then discovered applications like, you know, um, Wine. I don't know how many of you here. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So I started using Wine and then that sort of encouraged me to find a community. So for context, um, um, speaking about Wine, how many of you here heard about the One Laptop Per Child project or PC? Great, awesome, yeah. So I was mostly focused on a software project and that's how, uh, you know, I got into open source. Um, so started writing code and then eventually doing more community work. Um, and I think that's kind of what like sort of started my career and eventually, um, I don't know, like, like folks from the OSPO team at Google, um, you know, doing things like uh, GCI and, and GSOC and, and a couple other projects sort of like encourage that. So, and trying to bring that history down to how Oscar w w was, was created was because in 2017, I had the opportunity to, to go to one of the mentor summits. And while it was a global event then, I, I, there was a conversation that I was having then with Stephanie. And I was like, oh, okay. I, I, I'm kind of curious around why there were fewer folks, you know, within the continent in there. Of course, there were things like visas and a couple of other things that was beyond our control. But I think what was in, in, important then was the fact that there were 
less people at that time trying to understand the value of why they need to do open source. So that's kind of how the advocacy started. And then, you know, the Oscar, which we've been talking about, sort of like, you know, we kickstarted the idea. So over to you. Um, so Didi, can you talk about this? Yeah, sure. Um, so my open source story actually was inspired by Samson. So if you knew Samson at the time, like 2017, like he, you could t tie him to open source. Like that was his personality. I was talking about it every time. Just give Samson a mic and he's like, have you heard about open source? Like let's start contributing. Um, so I knew him through um, the community, I think through Twitter or Facebook, I can't remember. Um, and then uh, we met up at one G Dev Fest event in Abia State, which is a state in Nigeria. And we eventually started talking. So I reached out to him and I was like, hey, I see you talk about this thing a lot. Um, he would oftentimes share the benefits that he gave to him, how he was able to like learn, how he was able to improve his career and stuff like that. And at the time I was still in college. So I was looking at um, kind of like cementing my career in tech, trying to figure out where I wanted to be, if I actually wanted to continue a career in tech and like what I wanted to do. So I was just having conversations with people. And then he shared like his experience again, went into more details and also shared how I could contribute to open source. I remember the first um, organization I contributed to is called Open Data Kit. At the time I used to be an Android developer. So I went there, looked at good first projects and started contributing. And I mean, it wasn't as easy as I thought it was going to be, but I think that one great thing was that um, the community there was very supportive, right? So if you had a question, you would just drop it on the pull request and then someone will come to help you out. And eventually the um, pull request was merged. Like, I cannot explain how happy I was that day. Like, I was so excited. I could not believe that the change I had made was going to be used by like thousands of people because that um, open source organizations was used by several people all, all over the world. And because I was just starting out my career in tech, it was like insane to me. Like I was so excited. Um, and then just pretty much just build up from there. I continued to contribute to other organizations like Media Wiki, which powers Wikipedia, and eventually um, participated in the Google Season of Docs program, the first one that came out. Um, and I feel like I had so many great career pushes from that. For instance, when I joined a company called Intas, which is a software engineer, one of the key things that made that possible was sharing my experience with open source and how I was contributing and working on their API documentation. So I would say it's one of the key things that pushed my career to where it is today. Thank you so much for sharing. For me, it was very different. Um, when I left school, I joined an organization as an intern and the person I was working under would pretty much go to GitHub, clone repositories, change a few things and sell the software. And I didn't know how I felt about that because I didn't even know what open source was at the time. However, um, some time back, I joined um, Facebook Developer Circles. And under Innocent, Innocent Amadi, I was able to learn what open source actually was and what licenses meant, how to use open source, how to contribute to open source, governance, community, and all that. And I felt really ashamed that the person I had worked under would go to GitHub, clone re repositories, and sell, and sell it as his own, you know. Um, it was it was heartbreaking for me, and that was what motivated me to, you know, start talking about open source, um, getting people to know what open source actually is. Um, you know, <laughs> unfortunately, a lot of people actually do that, going to GitHub, cloning projects, and then claiming those projects as their own, which shouldn't be. And for me, that was the driving force. That was what um, drove me to Oscar. That was what. Um, made me even volunteer to um, become an engineering lead at Oscar, right? Um, and that was it for me. So my story is quite different, but <laughs> I hope it actually makes sense. So we're going to talk about what um, it is currently at um, open, um, open Source Community Africa. So I'm going to start by asking Samson a few questions. So can you give insights um, into what open source is currently at Africa or in Africa and 
Like, what are the things that has led to where it is currently? Oh yeah, I think that's a that's a very interesting question. Uh, so basically, the 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 current drive right now, if you go to I don't know, if you do any research right now, I think even GitHub, um, you see that um, majority of that is the young population. I think that's kind of, it's similar to what you see in Asia, like especially in India. It's like very, very similar because there's a lot of, unlike the West where like, you know, most people discovered open source, you know, later in the career. There are people that are either hearing that word through like, you know, uh, the Facebook developer circle, Oscar, or, you know, um, DevFest and other community that are out there. So the energy to want to, you know, write your first software or, you know, become a community manager or do something within the ecosystem kind of drive that. Um, so basically in the last five years, because I could, I could kind of trace, you know, things as, as, as far back as five years. So in, in 2019, um, when I think I believe I was, I was in open source summit NA in Paris, I think it was in 2019, I believe. So coming back, um, we were like, oh, we need to see if people are interested in talking about open source and sharing what they're doing. So that was kind of how we created Open Source Festival. I don't know if how many of you heard about that. Um, it's kind of the, kind of now the one of the most important open source conference on the continent, Africa. And so when we started the idea, um, which was part of the open source community, we're like, okay, we want to see one, what people are interested in doing, what are the focus of what they're doing, and of course, like how important is the term open source is. And when we eventually did the open source festival, which was interesting, after the first version, two days after the open source festival, then there was the pandemic. So that was, to some people, that was the last event, including mine. Um, but what was interesting is seeing how people view open source. I think for them, in that part of the, in that part of the ecosystem, it's totally different from what you expect, you know, in the Western world, where in most cases you see companies defining what open source is and then people get into open source. But the concept of community in some part of Africa is very cultural, right? It's, a, you know, some people come from a very large family. So the idea of like doing things together and sharing things together is kind of like default. But what <laughs> I'm laughing right now, one of the interesting things that is a little bit different is when you say, okay, we want you to do something that feels like can make a lot of impact financially for free, right? So the idea, the ideology of volunteering is a little bit different, right? So I think that's kind of one of the things that was very, very interesting. So looking at, looking at the last five years, I would say the most important part that I've seen is the fact that open source has given more room and more opportunity for people to express their skills and then get more global opportunity again maybe because of the pandemic right so that has again that the 2020 was a really really big year on the continent and i think and again if you look at the get up data right uh, which we'll definitely talk more about you see that since 20, 2019 i believe there have been consistent growth year after year which is which is really really cool so i think again it, it's it's the fact that when you're fresh out of college, you want to go get jobs, you're kind of like fighting with someone with like 20 plus years experience, right? So a job is telling you that, oh, you need like 10 years and you're just fresh out of college and you're probably 22. So it's like, oh, how do I gain 10 years of experience, right? So that's kind of like, you know, people hack their way in by, you know, contributing when, when, it's, when you're in college. And then that makes it a lot easier when you're out of college and to, to kind of explore stuff. So. That's interesting. You mentioned GitHub while while you were talking. I read an insta uh, interesting stats. I can't remember when, but then sometime this year, GitHub released a report that in Africa, open source has been growing year on year, and in Nigeria specifically, um, it's been growing at a 45% forty five percent rate year on year, right? Um, Didi, what do you think is the reason for that um, growth? Yeah, um, I think most of things also ties back to what Samson had said. Um, but I would say that people really started talking about their experiences with open source, right? Prior to like, let's say 2017, I, maybe there was just like 10 people in, in, let's say Nigeria, for instance, who knew about what open source was. Because people don't typically want to contribute to something and not get paid for it. It feels weird. Like if you think about it, like in, in Nigeria and Africa, 
if you have to do something for somebody, you have to get paid for it, right? So it was like a, a foreign concept, so to speak. Like, why should I go and contribute to an organization when I would not have any monetary value from it? Um, so I would say that one of the things that caused this was people sharing different perspectives on this, right? It's like sharing things like, hey, maybe you will not get money from contributing to an open source project, but your skills could actually improve or you could get connected with people who may, may like, let's say, recommend you to a different, to a job opportunity, or you could just like learn things I would not typically learn because you don't have access to a job, right? Because I think one of the key things about, um, open source contributions that is great is it gives you an opportunity to contribute or develop um, skills that you would not typically get if you're not working for a company. So one of the things that really changed during that period was people who were already in open source were sharing their experiences, talking about how it helped their careers, talking about how it improved the potentials of them getting jobs, for instance, and then also sharing that, hey, there are some um, scenarios or cases where you could actually contribute to open source to get um, and get paid because like I said culturally the end goal of every um, person in tech in like Nigeria and like other African countries is how is this thing going to be beneficial to me so when you're trying to teach them something when trying to like share like an opportunity or like a new initiative you need to tie it down to how would this thing be beneficial to them at some point it may not be immediately but they must just want to know how it's beneficial to them. And then even from like the perspective of building your own projects, right? So you talk about how, hey, you trying to build your own project who is going to help you improve your skills, going to help you um, connect to other people in the same um, technology space, which would also improve your, your, your knowledge or perspective on the issue. So one thing was we talked about it a lot. I was always sharing how I contributed to open source, how it helped me land my job at Intas, which is a software engineer, how I contributed to um, video LAN. So for context, I had been using VLC since I was a child. Like anybody, I think it's really, it's popular worldwide, but I think one thing that Nigerians really like about it is how it makes like whatever you're trying to play with is very, very loud. Like you could use any other media player and it would not give you the sound, but once you use VLC, it's like, okay, let's get this going, this is it. So I was using it in like secondary school, which you guys call high school for so long. And then I remember when they announced Google Season of Docs and I saw it and I'm like, oh my God, can I actually contribute to this organization? Like I've been using this platform for so long and I applied and then got in, so it was like, insane to me that a tool that I've been using since I was like a child is something that I was contributing to. And so when you share stories like that with people, they feel like, okay, hey, if you did it as well, I can also do it too. So that's the first one. We're always talking about it. And then the second one would definitely be the open source festival. It was an opportunity where we were like almost like 500 plus people together to a room to just talk about open source. Like, not just contributing, you could build your own projects, not just, it's not just about coding, because people would often think that it's only um, like code contributions that you could make to open source. So sharing that you could be a technical writer, you could be a designer, you could be like a community manager and still be able to contribute to open source was also very helpful. We had people who came back like in the next version of Oscar Fest and said, wow, my life was literally changed because I attended the previous event. And at some point, I think like two, three years after, um, Outreachy, I think Africans were like the most people who got accepted into Outreachy. And if you, if, you, if you think back, you realize that, let's say three, four years before then, you would literally not see one African. Like even if you see, maybe it's just one, but then I think in like 2021 or 22, I'm not quite sure, if you went to the Outreachy um, website and scroll down, you'd literally just be seeing like different black people, <laughs> which was so cool. We we're like, wow, this is like the impact that we get from like talking about open source, Oscar Fest, and like sharing the journey. So I would say those those um, two key, two things, which is talking about it, Oscar Fest, and sharing different ways that contributing or building your own projects would help you grow your career eventually. Awesome. Um, I, I, I'm also a product of communities, so <laughs> I think that point is very important. Um, we're almost out of time, but then I want to hear of the challenges that um, open source in Africa is actually facing right now and what Oscar has done to, you know, help people navigate all those challenges that um, come with contributing to open source. Okay, this, this is actually pretty, pretty interesting. Um, so straight to the point, I would say like there's a, right now there's a global, 
should I say pandemic, but like there's a global uh there's a global challenge right now with open source funding like you know you know ospo and and uh, stuff so right now what what the yeah <laughs> okay so <laughs> okay, no worries. yeah so right now what what's what's been happening is so the first is you know on the continent is that one thing that a lot of people don't understand is like there's a lot of languages right i we're from the same country and there's like 700 plus languages and the average person you would meet in Nigeria is probably multilingual, right? Not me, I just speak one language. <laughs> but yeah, so there's that aspect of it. There's that one, there's religion, there's like a couple of the things. And why I would say yes, Oscar, which we represent, have tried as much as we can to cover as much region as possible. We're still really doing pretty bad in the northern side of the continent because again, it is so expensive. Like I can imagine my flight is probably cheaper flying to the States than going from like Nigeria to like Morocco. Like sometimes I have to go out of the continents to go into the continents. Right? So there's a lot of things that I can I could talk about which which would stretch a lot of time. But I think the things that were were much of a big challenge was one, the structure aspect of it, because now um in, in the JavaScript ecosystem there's a a very big framework called Chakra UI. I don't know if anybody you know, you know Chakra UI. So it was created by Nigerian, right? So you see like a lot of people are now beginning to build projects and like building things that organizations and people use, right? So I would say once upon a time it used to be a unique problem, which is still a unique problem in terms of logistics and visas and support and even companies hiring in the continent, right? But now it's all about we're getting to the point where they are now approaching those global problems and they're not realizing like, oh, is this a specific problem that is here? So for example, if I'm building an open source project, can I eventually build a company out of it? Because that's kind of what's been happening in the last two, three years now. There are like a lot of companies that are kicking off from open source. So I would say, yes, there's still a lot of fundamental problems that kind of need to be fixed. Um, Oscar is addressing that. Some organizations are addressing that. There are still tons of programs that enable those those these people to do those things. But I think the the majority here is the fact that one. I I always keep saying this is like I think the fact that some orgs still kind of maybe it's kind of an EMEA kind of a grouping where they feel like okay like the whole of the continent is kind of the same. So there's like one framework that would work everywhere. I, I would say it's kind of a lazy DevRel strategy <laughs> because I'm in DevRel. It's like, you just can't take what works in, in, in London and take to Paris, right? So why do you expect something that would work in Ghana that would work in South Africa? Like it's totally very different, right? So I think, you know, the, the, the yes, there's a work, there's some amount of work that kind of we need to do more. And I think that's kind of why Oscar is interesting because over the years, true Oscar fairs, why we focus a lot trying to educate people on the continent we give people room from the western world like you know for example google has been really interesting over the years supporting open source of africa because again that kind of give them more context like oh like maybe even give them direct feedback of like oh how do we do gsoc how do we do you know how do we improve over there and i think even outreach even hired i think the the community manager right now in outreach is is a nigerian and then that gives context to like okay how do we um for example, one of the interesting, very maybe a little bit controversial take that uh, was interesting was when I heard about Outreach from my Sugar Labs days was the definition of diversity didn't work in Africa. So it was like anyone that is not male, I think originally that was the definition. I might be wrong, but that was interesting because that didn't work on the continent, right? So it was like, so what do you now say for black male? Like, you know. It was it was a little bit interesting, right? So, and I think I was talking to the team. I was like, hey, I, you know, I, I kind of understand what actually stand for, but you know, I would say if if Google want to hire someone right now in a software engineering job, there are like a lot of pillars that would go through before eventually going to the continent. And I think again, those kind of feedback sort of enable the program to be more accessible. And I think that's kind of what what is important, making sure that you know. The problems that we have, we identify our problems, and then we see how we can solve that more globally. So, yeah. Um, Didi, can you also throw more light on that? Um, I would say other challenges that people face in Africa in general would be things around like resources, right? Um, and so I, I remember 
for context, I used to be pro-Nigerian. Like, whenever people wanted to leave Nigeria to a different country, I'm like, no, let's stay and make it work. Let's stay and make it happen. Uh, but that changed on a faithful day when I had, um, I wanted to give a workshop on Kubernetes. My manager and I had been practicing a couple of weeks before. So we were like ready to educate people on what Kubernetes was. And then when it was time to join the call, suddenly I could not join Zoom anymore because my internet provider was off. Like, and, and and for context, I had just joined the company like one month before. So you can imagine being really being ready to like show them what you're made of and like giving the, the talk and all. But then I couldn't join the call anymore. And my manager then had to um, like take it up and like start up the conversation. I had to go somewhere else to be able to find better internet access to join the call. And it was at that very moment that I was no longer pro-Nigerian <laughs> and I decided that it's not it's not great that you have to wake up in the morning and think oh is the internet going to work today or is the power going to be good or would i be disconnected because when you wake up and not worry about menial things like that you can actually use your brain for more productive stuff so i would say that that's like one of the key challenges because um there are people who do not even have um like the money to be able to get like some sort of constant power supply or even internet for them for themselves and it's so difficult that no matter how rich you are you could never really reach that point where you're like fully secure that nothing is going to go wrong like the power would not go off or the internet would not go off right because something might happen so i would say that's like one of the key challenges with africans being able to contribute because you're either thinking about power or thinking about like internet or maybe most times your your lap you do not have a laptop you don't even have um the resources to be able to get that going um and one of the ways that oscar has tried to solve that is by um implementing different chapters in like different countries in africa so we when we started oscar we we're like we we're very conscious about not making it a nigerian thing not making it something that was only based in Nigeria. So we have different chapters in like Ghana, Kenya, um, Togo, and several other African countries. And then we then encourage people to host events where people can come to like a, a like a workspace, for instance, and learn about open source and contribute because it's it's one thing to just come and say, hey, open source is this, you can do this, you can do that. And it's another thing to actually give people the opportunity to be able to contribute, to be able to actually build something. And having that saluted place where you can partner with like a company to give you a workspace where they would have like power and like internet makes it a lot better. And also having a community where you know that, hey, you don't necessarily need to come to, let's say Nigeria, for instance, which is one of the most active African countries when it comes to tech. And you can actually still do great things from wherever you are in Africa has been one of the things we're trying to do to solve that problem. I definitely think that there's more room to like implement more stuff and partner with more um, global companies to help us reach more people and share the news. Awesome. So I, I can actually relate to that part of um, internet. I remember that I had I had to give updates in a Kubernetes meeting. So I contribute to Kubernetes and sometimes I have to give the updates on what we've been working on. And I remember that on one, one of those days I was to, you know, lead the meeting and then I wanted to join the meeting and I wasn't able to join it because internet just went off, you know. So it's actually a huge challenge. It's a very big challenge. And based on that, I'd like to ask Samson, um, what does the future look like for open source in Africa? What do you think that we can do as a community um, um, to make open to make these contributions better? And then not just that. What do you think that? How do you think the global community can actually um, impact what we are doing with open source? Yeah, uh, yeah, that's a, that's a very good question. Uh, so, I, I, like I said, right, the the last ten year, ten years, right, uh, has been interesting. Uh, five years very active, ten years just around the lifespan of the average Afri uh, open source contributor. And you know, looking at myself, for example, um, and looking at the open, multiple open source projects that I've been doing over the years, um, it kind of shows that you know there's still a very great energy in the fact that you know, again, like I said. The, the and this is something I, I think I was talking to the folks at GitHub. They were like, okay, like it's it's there's a prediction that at some point the 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 most active contributors are gonna gonna be out of the US, right? Because of again more around demography, particularly around the age uh, and group. 
And so that being said, it just kind of shows that one, there's a large opportunity for more advocacy to be to be met, right? I think we've done that, like we didn't ask it, we've done amazing work. All the organizations have done really, really great work. So I think the next phase, and, and the stats are great, right? If you look at anywhere right now, there are copper research. I'm currently doing one research right now. And there like, are copper research about challenges, fixes, and you know, millions of things right now that a lot of people are doing. But I think the, the thing that I'm beginning to see, and, and this is interesting, is the rise of companies. I think there's, I can't believe, I think the, um, uh, Cloudflare bought a company made by Nigeria, and I think it was a dev tool, which I saw the announcement. It was kind of really, really interesting. So I think that the the next phase is basically encouraging people to not just contribute to projects like you know Genome and, and, and other likes, but to think about like things that it could solve locally, right? Like you know, it could be social impact projects. It could be things that enable the government. For some reason, our government or Microsoft are really great friends, <laughs> you know, so it's like, you know, they spend a lot of money on doing a lot of things, right, um, which is quite interesting because, again, if you go to some part of, like, Europe, it's a little bit different conversations, right, um, there are governments now with OSPO, there are universities right now with OSPO, I think, within the U.S., and these are things that I think might change, especially maybe, maybe this is the, the only positive thing about AI, you know, might be the, the, the new change because, again, this, this is giving more room for more people to, to have access to, for example, I, I remember um, writing a code like 12 years ago and I was checking the, the code and didn't remember anything. And I'm like, oh, okay, how do I fix this problem? And I eventually and I fixed it. And, and that kind of shows you how this can give more opportunity for more people to, to thrive. But I think, again, going back to what I was trying to say is, I think the next big thing that I would see or I'm, I'm beginning to see is a new rise of project, right? There are a lot of people that are beginning to build tools that company rely on. Um, a very close a very close friend of mine, his name is Prosper Temuiwa, he's, for a particular period of time, he was the most trending developer on GitHub for PHP. Uh, for context, he was trending higher than Google and Microsoft on GitHub for about six months like one person, <laughs> right? So, so and, and this just to kind of show like the opportunity and, and really great opportunity that a lot of people can, can take. And that's kind of why, you know, one of the things I've been learning, especially um, with other affiliations that I have beyond Oscar. So I sit on the board for, um, I don't know if, how many of you here know the Open Source Collective or Open Collective platform. Yeah, great. So yeah, so I sit on the board on Open Collective. And one of the things that, I have seen is like a whole lot of new people are beginning to, you know, put in open source project to get funding, right? And looking at that, I'm beginning to see, you know, increase of numbers from the continent, right? And and I think that that's, in my opinion, that should be the next focus, right? Focus where an individual developer can eventually be the dev tool, raise a couple money from VCs if they choose to go that route, and then hire people locally to build stuff. You know, maybe it might be a little bit different from the Silicon Valley approach, or maybe it's kind of the, what Silicon Valley right now is doing. <laughs> but I think that's kind of, in my opinion, I think that's kind of the future, right? The future is, you know, obviously increase advocacy, but of course build, build and expand and get more people to to actively work on it. So I think that's kind of what is is my own personal goal. So what I like, what I would like to see. So. Um, at this point, I'd like to maybe take questions from the audience. I don't know if there's anyone that has any questions to ask. Awesome. Let me, let me bring the mic right. <laughs> no, it's fine. It's fine. <laughs> thank you. Um, thank you very much. It was really interesting. And, and one of the questions I was going to ask had to do that you, you covered really well with some of the challenges that Africa is <laughs> is composed of a lot of different cultures and and countries and it and it varies quite a bit. But one of the things I noticed that you presented up there was, and I think it was Kenya, um, provides some programming in primary school. Um, so I was curious. I wanted to kind of tug on that thread a little bit. It seems like. Well, you have a lot of challenges. This is something maybe you're doing really well and ahead of the West in a lot of ways. Um, I mean, I could be wrong, but I don't think we're doing a good job of, of really <laughs> starting people early. My question has to do with 
um, while they're teaching programming, are, are you also, or is OSCA perhaps also helping to influence some of what's getting taught early on? Because that is quite an investment. Okay, yeah, that's, that's a very good one. So uh, I think, so I'll answer this question from OSCA and non OSCA, right? So OSCA, we're, we're, we're doing advocacy and know that organization, companies and government are aware, right? Right now, I think I'm kind of having some conversations with our government related to that. So, but this is interesting because in 2018, I used to work for the UN and one of the specific work I was doing with the UN, an African union, which is kind of the equivalent of the European Union, was to kind of find ways that they could work with other governments to incorporate um, computer science and make it, technically speaking, in Nigeria, computer science or computer studies, uh, let me take the science a little bit, Compu uh, computer studies are kind of the fourth from primary to up to secondary, yeah, secondary, yeah. So by default, you understand the basics of computer, um, um, what language you choose to learn, whether Fortran and JavaScript is depending on your school and your and your lecture, um, your teacher um, range, um, and and that's kind of kind of shows around for me. For context, when I was in high school, my school was working with Harvard and MIT, so I was specifically in an exchange program with MIT Media Lab. Um, so basically, the OPC project was kind of baked into our curriculum. So at some point I was not just, you know, learning in school, but I was also helping to improve the curriculum enough to, to send across different countries. So at some point I was working on curriculums with some folks at MIT to expand curriculums to countries like Uruguay, Argentina, and India, right? So it's, it's kind of like a cross collaboration that was going on. So again, there are a lot of use cases, a lot of schools with different unique experience. And of course, Kenya is no no exception here, but it's, it's just to kind of show that, yes, fundamentally speaking, that's the reason why the numbers are growing, right? You're seeing close to a million plus developers right now on GitHub actively contributing. So of course, there's a lot of awareness. It's just more around what to do with that pipeline. Like, you know, there's a lot of people writing code. So what do we do with that number, right? So I think that's kind of where we are right now. Yeah, so just to add to some of the things he has said, um, I, I, I would say that one of the reasons why um, Africa in general is very much focused on trying to incorporate tech, tech into like young people, primary, secondary, that's like high school and college, is because um, we are at the point where we realize that some of the things that the country started out with is not really effective anymore, like to the economy, for instance. So let's say Nigeria, for instance, which used to be very much on like the oil sector, like providing to other countries, we don't really have that access anymore. So the country is not making as much money as they used to from those things. And I think that, I mean, from my experiences with people, I feel like Africans are very resilient people, people who want to have like a better life for themselves, want to do better. So oftentimes they tend to do things that the other people have said are working well, right? So if you see somebody who started out um, with like going to school, probably wanting to become like a lawyer someday, and then eventually changed their career and went, went into like science and technology and eventually doing well in their career now, that would motivate you because you're like, hey, it worked for this person. It would also work for me too. So that's like one thing people are very much reliant on. So if you see success stories everywhere, like in these different like countries, you feel more motivated to go and do that for yourself. And another great thing is that people are always very willing to pay forward. Like all of our careers here was very much impacted by communities, people coming to share their story, people coming to like teach you about things. So for context, I studied computer science, but I, I never really knew what I wanted to do with it. I would have probably not been in tech today if I didn't attend like a deaf fest um, conference where someone was sharing their story and like teaching about tech. So it now made me realize, oh, it's not just what the lecturers are teaching you, like the board explanations or explaining code that you don't really understand. There is so much more that I could get from this. So that encourages people to go back and actually learn. And let's say I do I do well in my in my local community, I will be like, hey, I want like 10 other people to do well. So I go in there and I'm like helping these 10 other people to do well. And when they do well, they now go in and I'm like, hey, okay, I want two to do well. So I think that just keeps moving on and on. So I would say that's like one of the, the key things that has really helped to push 
um, tech within Africa. Like I can think of like six, seven years back, I remember the people who were actively championing and talking about like Prosper, Codebase, a um, couple of them. And then you'd see that even in this current generation, there are like also people that you can point out who are actively talking about it. And then you'd see people who had benefited from those conversations now talking about it too as well in their own different communities. just one last question we're out of time thank you so much for your panel um i learned a lot um i'm asking for i work for a um a project and we are ch always looking for new ways to retain new talent and also get uh, make it a safe place for people who are experiencing challenges and what's worked. We know that what worked in the United States does not work in other countries. So how can we reorganize our thinking so that we're thinking for the barriers that you face there um, with respect specifically to racism and um, how we can be more receptive? Okay, I'm going to answer that um, so I once gave a talk about um, accessibility and the best person to tell you how to make maybe software accessible to them like if you're going to talk about accessibility for the blind for example the best person to tell you how to make software accessible to them is a blind person right because if we go like we're going to approach them with our own thinking and our own experiences which is not the same as theirs so i think that the best way to actually do that is to um, maybe have someone in your advisory that actually experiences what the other side experiences and then you know have the person share feedback um, share their thoughts with you um, see from their perspective and i think that's one of the things that actually works really well and i've tried that and it works for me in a couple of projects so I, i'd say if you try that it might work for you yeah <laughs> thank you did i answer your question yeah. awesome um <laughs> okay just <laughs> yeah hi um yeah, wonderful talk. Uh, I really related to the, you know, struggling with wine to get something that was meant for Windows. It, for me, it was Minecraft. Um, I was wondering, you know, there's so much wonderful discussion about advocacy and you know, education and such. Um, and then, you know, you briefly mentioned the idea of like so much of programming, like resources and projects are, you know, very like English centric, like Western centric. Um, are there, so, you know, as a two parter, like, are there ways in which you can make like a particular open source project more accessible to the global community or you know specifically to, to the African community? And then um, are there any projects that are you know out there today which you know contributions to them like disproportionately are, are helpful for these sorts of like you know contributing to this open source project is, is good for, for increasing access? Do you want to take that? Yeah, that, that's a very good question. So I, I remember it's doing this for, I think, two projects. I think the first was Sugar Labs on the, the, the software side of the OPC. We, I think I remember the, we, in, in the, we took the entire operating system um, and then we did a translation to three languages. I mean, it was great. It was great. Like, we were able to um, um, get people, especially schools, because the, it's an educational tool. Um, people were using it. So, but I think for me, in terms of, I have a very interesting take about accessibility, which is maybe a little bit different. Mine is, if you want to solve a particular problem to a particular people, right, just hire that person, hire people in a particular region to solve that particular problem. So that's kind of my ideology. I've always been like focused on that. Um, and the reason is because I I wouldn't give an answer to 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 what would work in South Africa. I've only been to South Africa once. And I think it was kind of in Pretoria, which is not a general re representation of, the, of South Africa, right? So it's like, 
I was like, oh, okay, I've been in South Africa once. That doesn't make me an expert, right? Uh, I can give context. I could, I could understand some things enough to flag things, but not enough to execute things, right? Um, so again, and that is just me being transparent, right? And I think it's, again, it's, it's because of the way that the continent is being viewed, right? If you want, again, if you go to Europe, you can't expect someone in the UK, I mean, except from Brexit, but you can't expect someone in the UK execute something that would work in the Netherlands, right? So why are we hiring someone, let's say one person, to serve an entire continent, right? It's like crazy, right? So again, so I think there's a lot of fundamental things, and again, which kind of goes back to what Princess mentioned about the best way to solve this problem in terms of accessibility is to get get in there, and that's kind of why we've we've given companies, project. I think the GNOME Foundation has been great. You know, I think I've been directly, they've been directly involved with the Oscar Fest event since 2020, so about five years now and counting, which is great. And, and, and the goal thing there was they were trying to, you know, the, the future of desktop in Linux has, has always been improving. Maybe in the next 10 years, Linux will take over, right? So there's always these conversations. And, and, and you know, one of the interesting thing there was, I don't think there's any software project that have less participation of Africans than writing code in a desktop language, a desktop project in, in like say like Fedora or whatever. Because again, the context, there's almost nobody, not almost nobody, but it's it's very hard to just run into someone using Linux, one of that Linux distro as a user. The chances that if you see someone like myself is because I'm testing something, right? Not because I'm using it. And this is not because in 2024, everyone is using Mac or Chrome or whatever. It's because it's just the reach, the, the, the hardware that goes onto, the hardware that gets sold on the continent don't, don't come shipped, pre-installed with whatever. And if they have the ability to want to install, let's say I want to dual boot, um, Fedora alongside my Mac, right? How many people have that technical knowledge to do that, right? So again, there's a lot of things that you kind of look at subjectively. But one, I did one test, right? I, I, I remember taking, I went, remember going to a school and we replaced the Windows computer in the computer lab and we did that and we put in Fedora and we kind of closely watched to see how the students were doing and trust me, they were frustrated enough to go learn programming language to, and start writing code. I don't know if that's a good thing. <laughs> I, I don't know if it's a good thing, but you know, I feel like frustration gets you running, right? And, and I think that that's sort of, in my opinion, that's how I think you know, the, those are kind of the ways to, to fix this. Sorry, just one last thing. I know we're running out of time was, um, Samson talked about hiring, but I also want to mention that there's like room for collaborations as well, right? You may not necessarily have the budget to like hire someone in like all of the different African countries. So if you collaborate to organizations like let's say Oscar, for instance, which has different chapters in these different African countries, it means that you can have access to these different people from like one organization. And it's not just Oscar, there are several other open source um, communities in Africa that you could, you could work with. We're way over time, and that brings us to the end of the session. Thank you very much. Thanks a lot for joining.